As we begin today, I want us to, we'll be in Galatians chapter 5, if you have your Bible, you can, you can turn there. Uh, I want us to think a little bit about truth this morning. I want us to think a little bit about truth. Because since the dawn of time, there has been a dangerous and deadly temptation to believe that truth is subjective. We see it in our world today. In fact, I would say it like this, that, that today we almost, it's almost commonly believed in our culture that truth is objectively subjective. Right? That, that, that our culture would say that it's objectively true, weird, because of what they'll say next, that, that truth is relative, that truth is subjective, that truth is, is relative to your feelings, your beliefs, your experiences. And this isn't a new issue, right? This issue of truth goes all the way back to the beginning, right? And we referenced this earlier this week about Satan's deception. You know, Satan is the master deceiver. He, he's the best liar. He's the father of all lies. And he loves to distort the truth. And Satan, as a good liar, often knows that the way you distort the truth or the way that you deceive is, is not by quickly going to the opposite of what's true, but incrementally, little by little, eroding trust in the truth. And so from whether it was Satan saying, did God really say to Adam and to Eve, or throughout history, uh, as we come even to Jesus' life and ministry, then as Jesus is brought before Pilate, and they're having a back and forth, right? And, and Jesus affirms that when Pilate calls him, the Messiah, he says, you have spoken the truth. And Pilate, anybody? A little Bible trivia this morning. All right, anybody remember what Pilate said? What is, what is truth? Right, what, what is truth? I, I mean, he was, a, he was a relativist already in the first century AD. And today we might hear people say things like, I'm living what? My truth. Living my truth. But here's the thing. There, truth is truth, and truth is not subjective, and it's not subjective to my feelings, or my experiences, or any other thing. And as we have been in this letter of Galatians, we see that, that Paul is passionate about the truth of the gospel, the good news that Jesus was and is the Son of God, that He became one of us, that He took on humanity, that He came, He was born of a woman, born under the law, that He might redeem all of us so that we might be brought back into relationship with Him, forgiven of our sin, restored, that we might know Him and glorify Him. And yet, often, there was a temptation to even drift away from that truth. And that's sort of the whole theme of the book of Galatians, is that they were being tempted to pull away from the truth of the gospel. And for them, it was going back to the law, saying that I had to be Jewish, I had to go through the rituals, I had to go through the circumcision, we had to follow the law. And Paul Paul said, no, that's a distortion of the good news. That's a distortion of the gospel. And in fact, in Romans chapter 1, and it'll be on the screen not to turn there, but Paul dealt with the fact that, that we often suppress the truth. It says in Romans chapter, 8, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them, because God has shown it to them. And for Paul, who wrote that, that letter in Romans, Jesus had come to him. And he knew that Jesus was the fullest revelation of God. And Jesus was truth in a person. He embodied what truth is. And so as Paul wrote this letter, he wanted to call them back. And you'll remember that it, it, back in chapter 1, he was shocked. He was shocked that they were so quickly turning away from the good news. In, in chapter 3, he said, who's, who's cast a spell over you? It, it seems like there's a spell that's been put upon you. And maybe in a way there was, because all lies come from Satan, the master deceiver. And Paul was, he was passionate about this because the gospel, he knew that it was most important. That Paul, for Paul, the primacy of the gospel, the, the power of the gospel, the purpose of the gospel was everything. And so... He wants, to, he wants to call them to the truth. So join me in Galatians chapter 5, verse 7. Galatians 5, verse 7. He says, you were running well. Who prevented you from obeying the truth 
right? And, and you kind of get the impression here. Like, Paul, Paul is upset, and he wants names. Tell me who did this, right? He says, you were, you were running well. Who, who is telling you these lies? Look at verse 8. This persuasion did not come from him who called you. He says, what you're being told, what you're being taught is not truth, and it didn't come from God, who is the source of all truth. And he says, a little, a little yeast leavens the whole lump of dough. He says, just as you only need a little bit of yeast to make a whole batch of dough rise. He says, a little bit of, a little bit of lies, a little bit of deception, right, when the truth is undermined will cause great problems. It'll be disastrous. Even a little compromise, even a small compromise with the truth can have disastrous consequences. Verse 10, in the Lord I have confidence in you that you will not accept any other view, but whoever is troubling you, but who, whoever it is who is troubling you will pay the penalty. All right, Paul, Paul believed. He says, I, 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 I'm warning you, I'm worried about you, but I'm confident that the one who called you and the one who saved you will bring you back to the truth. Look at verse 11. Now, brothers, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. And so he's talking about the persecution that he was receiving, not from Rome, but from the Jews, right? From the people who, who wanted to shut Paul down from preaching about Jesus. And he said, he said if, I was, if I was still tied to the law, I wouldn't be being persecuted, right? He says, but, he says, the offense of the cross, right? The cross was an offense, right? Because the cross says that you're guilty, the cross says that you're sinful. The cross says that the wages of sin is death. And there's nothing you can do to fix it yourself. And so he says there's an offense in the cross. But there's also beauty and joy. Because we realize, yes, there, I am sinful. But Christ is the Savior. And he died in my place and he sought to redeem me and to save me. So look at verse, uh, look at verse 12. And you can see Paul's passion. He says, I wish those who were disturbing you might also get themselves castrated. All right, now you're awake, right? It's like, okay, Paul, tell us how you really feel. Like, don't hold back, Paul. Like, like I, I grew up in, in about 45 minutes from here in, in South Jersey, all right? Greatest state in the world, all right? Get out of here. Yeah. All right, I got mixed results. Right, but, you know, you know people in this area, they're straightforward, Right? I think Paul could have been from Jersey easily, all right? And, and, and here's, here's why he's so passionate about this, because the gospel was being distorted, right? And there's no other means by which someone can be made right with God. There's no other way that you can be forgiven. There's no other way that you can escape the wrath of sin and the judgment of God except through Jesus, except through the cross. There's no other way. And Paul said, this is such an important issue that I am passionate about it, and I'm righteously passionate about it. Look at verse 13. He says, you are called to freedom, brothers. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the entire law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. Now, it's interesting here. He, he says you have, you're, you're free from the law. It's not about earning your way anymore. It's not about keeping all the rules and being good enough that God will accept you. Right? The message of the gospel is you are not good, but Jesus died for you anyway. And we looked at the story of the, of the prodigal son and the older brother and the father yesterday. And what a glorious picture of how God receives us. The younger brother filthy and dirty and broken, and yet the father runs to him and wraps his arms around him in total acceptance and love. And that's a picture of the gospel. And so we are called to, to not earn it, but to receive it by faith. We're called to freedom. But he says, don't use your freedom to go back and, and to live a sinful life. He says that, that, that we're free from the law doesn't mean we can do anything that we want. He says, but rather serve one another through love. What is he talking about? Here's the thing. Our lives are not just about us. Right? Our culture and our world will tell you to live for you because you are the center of the universe. Right? Live for you. Do what you want. And, and this isn't a new thing. It's always been like this. 
And what the Bible teaches us and what is true is that our lives impact other people's lives. Right? None of us are an island. And so my choices and my decisions impact others. They impact my family. They might impact my church, my community. They can even impact you, right? And so he says, love one another. How? By, by following Christ. He says the entire law is fulfilled in this one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? And loving my neighbor as myself means that I need to be following Christ. Because if I'm not following Christ, right? if, I'm not, if I'm not living, as we're going to see, in the power of the Holy Spirit, I might be leading my brothers and sisters into sin or into error or astray. And not only that, but it's going to cause divisions and dissensions. We talk about fighting and devouring one another. Jesus said this in John chapter 8. He says, Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, If you continue in my word, you are really my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Right? And so Paul wants us to live in freedom. And freedom from the law doesn't mean we do whatever we want, but now that we've been redeemed and now that the Holy Spirit lives within us, we are now empowered by the Spirit to follow Christ, to obey Him, not through the law, but through the Spirit. Right? Not through trying, not through earning it, not through effort alone, but through the power of God who lives in us. Verse 16 is so key in this chapter. Look at it with me. He says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of your flesh. He says, walk by the Spirit. And this is key. And Paul came to know this. He says, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, comes to live and dwell in every single child of God. Everyone who's called on the name of the Lord. Everyone who's saved. You have God living in you. Not only are you in Christ spiritually and positionally, but He is in you through the Holy Spirit. And the key, the key to victory, the key to overcoming sin and temptation, the key to following Christ is not my effort alone. It's not my will. It's not my, my discipline alone. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit and you will not, you will not fulfill or carry out the desires of the flesh. Right? This is so key. This is how we overcome sin. This is how we overcome temptation. Not by trying to change ourselves or better ourselves, but by walking in tune and in step with the Spirit. Now, you are all familiar with playing in tune, correct? Do you always play in tune? No. No. But when you're not in tune, what do you do or what do you seek to do? <laughs> Come on, you... Uh, all right, you seek to get back in tune, right? You tune your instrument, you, you realize like something doesn't sound quite right. right? And that's exactly what, what Paul's saying. He says we need to live in tune and in step with the Spirit. And there's going to be times in our life where God's going to say, I'm not in tune right now. I'm not listening. I'm not walking in step. You know, I was in marching band when I was in high school. I know it has mixed opinions right, around these parts, but it was a good experience for me. Uh, learning to walk in step was a challenge for me sometimes, right? But we had to because we got judged on that. We had to walk in unison, in step. And this is the picture that, that Paul is seeking to paint for us. That when we walk in step with the Spirit, when we rely on Him, when we depend on Him, that He empowers us to live out our faith and to follow Christ and to stay true to who He is, to the Gospel, to His call and purpose on our lives. And so when we walk in step with the Spirit, right, our lives begin to look more like Jesus' life, right? We have a, more, a longing to, to know Him. We have a longing to worship Him, to serve Him, to live for Him. When we're walking in step with the Spirit and we sin, we feel guilt and we feel conviction, right? And, and we are led and drawn to repent and to come back to Christ. And so this is such a key thought for Paul. He goes on in, in verse 17 and he explains a little bit more about why. He says, For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit. And the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. For they are opposed to each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So here's what he's saying. He says, as a follower of Christ, right, our old nature is still there. We still have temptations. We still sometimes have desires to do things that we know are not in line with God's will for our lives. There's a battle. There's a struggle. Right? It's almost like the old, you know, the old Bugs Bunny cartoons. Anybody... 
you know, they're still on YouTube, you can find them. All right, I loved Bugs Bunny growing up, but there, in some of those, you know, they had the little, you know, the angel on one shoulder and the little devil on the other shoulder, and it's not really like that, but have you ever experienced that tug, right, that I, I, I know I should, but there's something pulling me to do this, right, that's what Paul's talking about, and he says, we have desires that go against God's will, we have desires that go against God's ways. And our culture would say that you need to live out your desires, that living out your desires is who you are, that your desires are your identity, that your desires define you, but that's not true, right? Our desires sometimes are sinful. They, they, they might be real, but they're not what God is calling us to do. They're not, he's not calling us to live out our feelings, but he's calling us to live instead through the power of the Spirit, the truth of the gospel, and the truth of who he is. And he says, if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law, you're not, it's not through, through trying harder, but through the empowerment of the Spirit, he will help you and enable you to do what he's called you to do. And no, we won't do it perfectly. And no, it doesn't come easily. It, it takes intentionality, right? Playing in tune requires frequent adjustments. You can't just tune your instrument one time, can you? Right? right? You have to tune it how many times? Every day, every time, right? And we need that in, in our walk with Christ, right? We can't just, you know, be great if we say, man, I came to Chehi and I got in tune with the Spirit and I, I got close to God. I heard His Word. I was surrounded by other Christians and, man, I felt close to God. I'm in tune now and I'm good to go. I don't, I don't need to pray anymore. I don't need to read my Bible. I don't, I don't, need, to, I don't need to confess my sin. I don't need to do anything because I'm good. Wouldn't it be awesome if that was true in one way that we were all just good to go? But that's not how it works. We have to daily walk in tune with the Spirit. And that's key. It's not always easy, but it's so important. Because even though we're free from the law, and even though we're free from the eternal consequences of our sin, listen, in Christ there's no condemnation. Right, Paul would say in Romans 8. There's no condemnation, no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? That's an amazing truth. Right? But here's the thing. Sin in our lives here still has consequences and often devastating consequences, and I've watched it. Sin causes death, death of hope, death of opportunity, death of joy, death of relationships. And Paul will go on and he'll say, this message I'm telling you about grace and about the gospel is not a license to sin. Notice verse 19 and 20, and even through 21. He says, now the works of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, anything similar about which I tell you in advance, as I told you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right, so Paul's saying is that if your life is patterned by uncon unconfessed and unrepentant sin, that you should not think of yourself as a follower of Christ. Right, he's saying that if the pattern of your life, he's not saying that as believers we don't sin or might even do some of these things, but if the pattern of our life is that this is my identity, this is what I do, and I do it without guilt, I do it without even thinking about it, I do it without any conviction, Paul would say, don't think of yourself as belonging to the kingdom. Because the Holy Spirit, once he's inside of you, he's going to be convicting you of truth, he's going to be confronting you, he's going to be bringing you an awareness. And, you know, we don't like to be confronted with our sin, right? We don't like to be, conf I don't like to be confronted. We don't like to be told that our desires are not in line with God's will. They're not in step. And, you know, listen, as I've said before, we all have corrupted desires. We all have desires that go against God's good and perfect will. And it's okay. You're normal if you have those desires. It's part of living in a fallen world. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, God wants to give us the ability not to yield to every whim or desire that we have, but to yield to His Spirit so that we can live a life that pleases and honors God, that we can live a life that is good, that is filled with joy. And so as, as Paul goes on, he, he's going to say, these are, these are things that characterize our old life, but notice what characterizes the new life. Verse 22 and 23, this is probably familiar to you. We call them the fruit of the Spirit. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit, and it's a singular word, fruit, right? So these are all connected, right? Does that make sense? That he's not saying there's, there's many fruits of the Spirit. He says there's one fruit, and this is how it's manifested. He says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So what's Paul saying? He's saying 
that the Holy Spirit produces these kinds of things in our life, that if you're walking in tune with the Spirit, that these things ought to be being produced in your life. Right? And love, love is to be the defining characteristic of a follower of Christ. Jesus said if you, that all people should know that you're my followers if you what? Love one another. The greatest commandment, Jesus said, was to what? To love God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. And the second is like it. What? To love your neighbor as your, yourself. Right? Love is to define who we are. Right? And so, and that love is to be a supernatural love that comes from the Holy Spirit living within us. Right? Earlier in chapter 5, Paul said this in verse 6. He says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. And so our lives are to be defined by love. And then he says joy. You know, joy is a gift from God. And I was on a mission trip uh, several years ago. I was in the Dominican Republic, and we were going around to Compassion International sites and visiting them, and uh, the kids would do a program for us. And mostly we were there just so they would have someone to, 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 to share with and someone to play with and to know someone cared about them. And we were at this one, we were at this one uh, compassion site. It was a huge site. And I mean, there was just so much excitement and energy in this place. And they were singing this song. And while they were singing this song, they started a Congo line, all right? So a little bit different than our culture, maybe. Uh, we probably won't ever do that at Chehi. Um, I don't make the rules, all right? So don't blame me. But they were singing this song. Of course, they were singing it in Spanish, and I was picking up a few words, but I didn't get all of the words. And I said, what is this song about? And they said, this song is about the fact that our God is a joyful God. And I never forgot that. Right? Our God is a joyful God. And so when we think about following Christ, right, that, that joy and is not found in sin. Joy is not found in living for self. Joy is not found from following every whim or desire of your heart. Joy is actually a gift that God wants you to experience through the power of His Spirit. And it should be produced in our life. And it, it goes above circumstances. These kids lived in absolute poverty. They didn't have anything what, materially what we would think that we have or that we need to be happy. But they had a joy that was supernatural. So Paul says there's love, there's joy, there's peace. That's not the absence of problems. But it's the power of the Holy Spirit giving us a settledness that no matter what I face or no matter what I go through, no matter what I encounter, that I belong to God. And He's got me. He says patience, not quickly irritated with others. Kindness. You know, kindness is so underrated. Kindness is so powerful. If you've ever been impacted by kindness, you'll know how powerful it can be just to be kind to someone. Goodness. It means to be generous with our lives, to live for others. Faith. It means to be reliable. Gentleness. The idea, has, the idea is being teachable, right? It's, it's being humble. Self-control. In, in this sense, it's not just self-discipline, but self-denial, not living for myself. And Paul says there's no law against these things. What is he saying? He's saying that the Holy Spirit doesn't lead us away from the things that the law showed us. It just empowers us to live them out differently, not through trying or striving, but through the power of the Spirit. Look at verses 24 and 25. It says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, we must also follow the Spirit. And so here he's going to circle back to, to what we love, what he shared in verse 16. He said, he says, if we belong to Christ, right, he says, you need to realize that your old life was crucified with Christ. We, we looked at Galatians 2.20, and it's such an important verse to me, right? I've been crucified with Christ. And that's what Paul's saying here. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. He says, it's not me anymore, right? But Christ lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so he says, we've crucified ourselves. We, we have been crucified with Christ, right? That, that we've given up our rights to self. We've given up our rights to live our own life. And we've now become a follower of Christ. We belong to him. And so he says, if we live by the Spirit, if you've been saved, if you've been born again, he says, let us, what? He says, let us keep, or we must follow the Spirit. We must stay in step with the Spirit. Right? And so my, my heart for you, as we wrap up this week, as we think about the message of Galatians, right, that there is truth, and truth has a name, and his name is Jesus. Right? And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. I hope that you will hold fast to the primacy of the Gospel. That, that you will not waver in your confidence that I might have questions, 
And I might have some doubts sometimes. And I don't know everything about the Bible, and neither does anyone. But there are some things that I can absolutely know that God has revealed and made absolutely clear. And it's all centered on this. Jesus really lived on this earth. He was born supernaturally of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. He really lived a perfect life, a sinless life for you. He really died on a Roman cross as a sacrifice for sin. And he rose from the dead. And he appeared to his followers. And he ascended to the Father. And not only that, but he sent his Holy Spirit upon them. In fact, Jesus told his followers this. He says, it's better that I'm going to leave you because the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will be with you. And I'm sure Jesus' disciples were like, no way. Like, why don't you stay right here with us? Because, like, Jesus right next to me, like, what could be better than that? Would you agree that that would be awesome? You'd get in a lot less trouble, wouldn't you? All right? You're like, I think I'm going to skip practice today. Jesus is like, no. Nah. Right? <laughs> but we have the Holy Spirit living within us. Right? We have God with us. And Jesus said, that's even better. So I want you to hold fast to the truth. And say, yes, I might have questions or doubts, but I'm not going to waver from the truth of the gospel. Because that's my only hope. And that, remember that the gospel is powerful. Right? It's not just words. It's not just facts. The gospel is powerful. And it has the power to save. It has the power to seal us and to sustain us and to strengthen us. And the purpose of the gospel is what? That we might glorify God. That's why you were created. It's why you were made. And so as we, as we wrap this up, I want you to remember that our new life in Christ is not to be lived by legalism, trying to keep the law, and it's not lived by license to sin, I can do whatever I want, but rather through the leading and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And that's not a middle way. Right? The way of Jesus is not splitting the law and license. Right? It's not saying, no, it's halfway between law and license to sin. No, it's a brand new way through the power of the Holy Spirit. So while I'm calling you to hold fast to these truths. I also want all of you to know that the God who saved you will also keep you. And He will hold you. We're going to close a little bit differently this morning. We're going to sing a song after we pray called He Will Hold Me Fast. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want us to use this time to just allow God to seal in our hearts and in our minds maybe what He's wanting to show you, to teach you, what He wants you to carry away from this week spiritually. I mean, I'm sure you've grown as a musician. You've grown relationally. You've grown in friendships. And all those things are important. They all are very important. But how have you grown spiritually? What is God teaching you? What is he leading you to do? So let's pray together, and then we'll close in the song. Father, I thank you for your word that's living and powerful and true. I thank you for your love that led you to give your son to us and for us. I thank you that he really lived, and he really died, and he really rose from the dead. Father, I thank you that we can be forgiven of our sin. I thank you that we can be adopted and accepted unconditionally by you, and that we can receive your love when we least deserve it. And Father, I thank you that your love never ends and it never runs out. I thank you that you never give up on us. And Father, I thank you that you will keep us till the end. And so Father, as we seek to hold fast to the truth, Father, I pray that we would do so knowing that you hold us. And Father, I pray that you would empower every student, every staff, counselor, faculty member, to hold fast to you, to live for you, and for your glory. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.